uh, don't worry. Uh, they've got it all covered. They're going to close this uh, uh, budget shortfall of, for the fiscal uh, 19 budget and close up that um, $203 million hole. Well, they have their good people, so let's see what they come up with. <laughs> and uh, do you like the idea of them uh, betting heavy on a Supreme Court decision? Is that, uh, is, that, <laughs> is that fair game? Well, it's not just betting heavy on a Supreme Court decision. It's effectively booking money that you legally can't book. So I, I have reservations about doing that. I think, you know, I don't have any reason to think that the court won't permit states to you know, have control of the sports betting. But the principle of including money in a budget that you have no legal authority to include uh, is a question. And that might be a, a little bit of a curveball. I, you know, I think that they run the risk a little bit, too, of just timing. You know, Supreme Courts make decisions uh, when they want to make decisions. And, uh, and also, they just surprise sometimes as to what's going on. So it, it'll be interesting. Talk, um, I want to leave the budget for a few minutes here in Rhode Island and go over to uh, the State of the Union. Uh, President oh, Trump nice. will be addressing uh, both houses of Congress uh, tomorrow evening. And uh, wh what is your uh, prognostication um, of what the President is going to say? Well, I think the tone will be one thing. And I think the tone will be a lot less confrontational than the uh, inaugural address. <laughs> I think that <clears throat> hopefully the President sees that the partisan fights are behind him, that uh, he can't pass anything in the Senate with 51 votes, so I wouldn't necessarily define it as putting an olive branch out, but I think the tone will be much uh, more statesmanlike and conciliatory. I certainly hope it will. As far as what's covered, I think there are a couple of things that will be covered. I think uh, he'll lay out in more detail his infrastructure plan, which will be interesting because it'll deal uh, with roads and bridges uh, and uh, land transportation, uh, and he'll be talking, I think, about private-public partnerships. And we've had a very mixed experience with uh, private sector <laughs> roads and turnpikes <laughs> in this country going, you know, going back to the Erie Canal a long time ago. Yeah, that's right. I think they oh, usually go bust, don't they? Isn't that kind of the, well, the track record? It didn't go, work well in prisons either. We're, we're good in Indiana and <laughs> Illinois and look at them. Uh, we, I think you also might be surprised, I'm not sure this will be in the state of the state speech, but I know they're interested. Uh, is a uh, national uh, 5G network uh, yeah. that, that I think, so that's kind of technology and innovation. I think he'll uh, try to, uh, I want to use the word pressure, but that's probably not a good description, uh, but try to sell his immigration plan mm -hmm. and uh, you know, talk about uh, the trade-off that uh, is where he's willing to go on DACA versus the things that, that he wants. I think uh, this will sound somewhat ingrained, but I think there'll be an economic victory lap taken at the state of the state speech. The economy is well. He can't help himself on that on taking victory laps. Well, let's hope uh, <laughs> as, as boring as he was in Davos. Let's hope he stays with the teleprompter. <laughs> What's written there? He is much better with the teleprompter. I also uh -huh. think that um, there's they, no chance he's going to tweet the entire State of the Union. No tweets to what, 280 characters right now. But he could just do a series of them. <laughs> yeah. He could insult virtually everybody in Congress by the well, course I, of the speech. I, I, I'm hopeful, and, and I don't know, if, but I'm guessing, uh, that there might be something that will surprise some of the Democrats about an urban reform program, rebuilding our cities, uh, you know, which was a Jack Kemp program. That was originally yeah, a Republican absolutely. program yeah. a long time ago. So I don't know if that'll make it to the State of the Union address, but I, things like that. And then I hope that he'll be politically wise enough to start to set the stage for the midterm elections mm -hmm. because. Uh, you know, right now, uh, life is going to be hell for him when the Democrats take over the House. They're going to be subpoenaed. What do you have for breakfast? It's yeah, absolutely. Thing. Right. Uh, he won the, the shutdown, hands down. Well, you know. I mean, I don't know what you win, yeah, but okay. from a political standpoint, you know, for the Democrats to shut down the government on a Friday and, ha and have to turn around and then vote for it on a Tuesday uh, without anything meaningful in trade, um, but it's a, it's a game without end because yeah. the next shutdown day is February eighth, so that's you know, about ten days from now. Yeah, and then there's a, a debt a ceiling requirement in, in March. So <laughs> we know those Tea Party guys love to vote for debt ceiling oh, every, uh, every, every, every uh, yeah. Friday and twice on Monday. But <laughs> but so you know it's a, the the game 
you know, continues. I think uh, I give Schumer a lot of credit. I think he made a good tactical retreat. He, you know, he he recognized that uh, he was on the wrong side of the issue to hold up keeping the government open for an immigration bill or for. Exactly. Couldn't Trump win on both scores, the government's back open, if he could reach a compromise on DACA, then it's a double win, <clears throat> and he actually might actually look on a social issue for the first time, presidential, that he could bring both, party, both, it, it, both parties it, you together. Know, it's interesting, because the proposal that he put forward, which I just know in very general terms, of uh, you know, 1.8 you know, million you know, DACA and extended DACA, uh, with a path towards citizenship, uh, seems to be pretty generous on the front end, but every time he talks about things that he wants on the visa lottery, on the wall, whatever that means any of these days, on chain migration, you immediately get a, a negative reaction from a big uh, wing of the Democrat Party. And uh, I don't necessarily have to agree or know to you or anybody with everything you put out, but he didn't put something on the table that was totally unreasonable. Yeah. And to get that kind of reaction, uh, you know, from the left, that they don't want to give anything on some of the other issues, uh, could backfire on them because he could seem to be the reasonable person on this issue. And can you even imagine that, that the Donald Trump would be the reasonable one in the negotiations? Um, uh, implications for Rhode Island. Where are we right now after a year of Donald Trump? Is Rhode Island in a better place or in a worse place? No, I think it's about the same place. About uh, the same? Yeah, I, I don't... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, to the extent that we have 4.1 percent you know, unemployment, to, the, the market dropped today significantly. But to the extent that the the market is up, Was, you know, wasn't that Apple driven? That the uh, I haven't looked. I just saw the yeah. numbers. But uh, <clears throat> to the extent that um, you know the economy is doing better, you know we're doing better. Uh, but it's cyclical, and there's not been any structural changes. I'm thinking, and I know this is a minority opinion of the state that the tax cut and jobs program will do some good, at least over the next two or three year period in the short run. But Rhode Island um, needs to make certain structural changes. It's, uh, we're such a small piece of the equation uh, that we have to take care of ourselves first. <coughs> well, it's interesting, Mike DBA said, uh, you know, I said, listen, low unemployment, great stock market. In the olden days, that meant uh, budget surplus, budget surplus, budget surplus. He said, well, revenue is actually up just not keeping pace with the growth of, of state government. And it, isn't that, at the, at the end of the day, the philosophical question about what the difference is between Republicans and Democrats? Well, it's the, it's the difference between <coughs> uh, progressives and fiscally responsible people. Uh, if I could use that description, <laughs> no, it's... it's, 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 it's there, there was no uh, political bent on that. No, no, there's, <laughs> you know, there, but, but there's, there's, a, there's an issue of uh, when spending grows quicker than, than revenue, you have deficits. And the problem, even from a progressive point of view, the point of view of people that, that feel that you expand government programs, is you, you put, unless you solve the structural deficit problem, you're in a kind of a fiscal limbo. Right. You're not in bad enough shape to have a problem, but you're not in good enough shape to make investments in the kinds of programs that you want to make investments in. Uh, and the other thing that, that no one talks about, which I can't put my finger on, but if you look at the governor's uh, budget, and uh, she has to include the economic forecast that's made by the Revenue Estimating Conference. Uh, between fiscal 18 and, and 23, uh, the average growth in jobs in the state will be less than 1%, a half of 1%. Income will grow by about 4% on average a year. Uh, inflation during that period is about 2.3%, so it's not, not significant growth in wealth. And then unemployment is going to tick up from 4.1% to 4.9%. So all the, the indicators that the budget's predicated on and the indicators that are used to project the out-year deficits are, are, are not uh, aggressive, uh, dynamic, robust uh, you know, figures. And that's the concern. Uh, you know, we're making all this investment in economic Do we need just more people? I mean, should you, that be? That's a very important, you've hit a very important issue. Economies have a difficult time growing without population growth, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and that's an interesting point about immigration because as the demographics of the state change, uh, if it wasn't for immigration, our, our population would be uh, be lower. At the same We'd be down to one senator and, and a third of a congressman if it weren't for immigration. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> maybe the rest. Of the, I don't think the rest of the country would cry about that. Do you? But uh, what, what does Guam have for yeah. representation in Congress? One. Uh, 
one, one delegate or something like but, that. But that's that's you know the, the the issue the issue here is you know the the, the robustness and dynamicism. And what is of particular concern is that we're not ignoring the issue. We're spending a hell of a lot of money on economic development programs, and we've had some wins. And but when you connect the dots with the wins to look at what's happening in the bigger picture, you, you don't see that kind of robust forecast. Well, it's interesting. Rajiv Kumar of uh, Virgin Pulse was in uh, at the beginning of the hour, and uh, they've jumped since acquisition and then made an acquisition. Uh, they've gone from about a net up about 100 people in just a couple of years. Um, are we focused on the right jobs? <coughs> well, let me ask a question. Did you, when you when Roger was in, did you ask him if he was having trouble recruiting people here? No, he said no. Okay. He said uh, they've, uh, they went from an average of 1,200 applicants per month to 2,400 applicants per month. Now he said, you know, listen, all 2,400 were not qualified for the position mm -hmm. that they're advertising, but I think he was pretty pleased that, that the number good. 2,400 uh, is pretty good. Um, so then we invest in training and education. Yeah. Uh, but it's all the above. And, yeah. and when you get in a position where government's picking winners and losers, is this a good job or this is good? All jobs are good. Yeah, uh, and right. people have different backgrounds, different skills. You know, the guy that uh, <coughs> is making forty or 50000 a you know, blue-collar worker, if that's what his capacity is, then we have to be concerned in our economic development program that that person is not left behind, that he gets the skills or she gets the skills they need in the future, but they also have to be earning income now and they can't just depend upon the government to support them. Um, we're seeing some fraying in Providence. Uh, you know, uh, there's been some uh, well, uh, Kate Nagel, our news editor, is up at a press conference right now on the recent second press conference in, uh, in a couple days on the number of shootings. Um, you know, I think uh, the police are frustrated, but there's, there's a disconnect between one aspect of the economy and growth and then the rest of the economy and uh, and and, and, that, decay. and that's the investment question, and this has becomes very tricky for government. Um, this goes back to Jimmy Carter. We have programs that aid our cities, but we don't have an urban strategy. And so it's fine to talk about a Main Street program and the programs that are not really at scale. If we're going to rebuild our economy, you really have to rebuild the capital city. Yeah, as difficult that is. Now we have the we've invested a lot in the. Uh, I-195 relocation project, but how is that really affecting uh, the capital city? Everybody that comes here now gets a tax break, a tax stabilization agreement. You used to grow the economy to create wealth, so you have a tax base to support your schools and your police <coughs> and your fire and your social... Your Listen, college. I think the net investment in 195, first of all, goes back to John Chafee as chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee, uh, getting some earmarks. I, I think the cumulative investment is about a billion dollars. And if you go over there right now, yes, there's a hotel over there, and Johnson & Wales has built a couple of buildings, but there is not a single new job ever created in that space, despite 20 years now of investment, other than the construction and demolition of well, that, that those jobs, highway infrastructure. You know, those are not permanent jobs. And Wexford is a great case study in point. Now, they you know, say there will be jobs created there, and we'll see. There will be jobs created in the hotel, there, um, you know, those kinds yeah, of the things. net the net number of jobs. I mean, we picked that part pretty well. It's about thirty net jobs once Brown moves eighty five down the hill. CIC is not a job other than those who run it. It is creating incubation space, but those jobs need to come from elsewhere, from startups. And there's already a lot of startup infrastructure in the city that is not fully maximized. Whether it's Founders League or some of these other spots that have been developed it well, and they are not. Uh, you know, overflowing uh, and don't have capacity. They have plenty of capacity. So it'll be interesting to see if that becomes the economic engine. Listen, we all hope it does, but I think there also shouldn't be over pumped as to what the realization is, is this is a long, hard fight. And how, uh, many, and how many jobs it can create and how you make investments. Now, one of the strong investments that we made was rebuilding the power plant yeah. and moving the joint nursing schools in there. Right. But that's a, that's a, uh, That'll create a synergy. It'll, it'll create some leverage for the, you know, for the city. So those kinds of public investments are, are positive. But the governor's proposed, for example, a $250 million bond issue to fix up schools, which I don't think anyone is opposed to safe and warm uh, schools for, for our kids. 
and mm-hmm. modernizing them. Yeah. I mean, not just that the roofs aren't leaking, but also integrate some technology into the buildings, and, et cetera. And, and how much of that money will go to Providence uh, in Central Falls, well, some, not so much Central Falls, but Pawtucket and Providence, uh, you know, where they're really deteriorating school facilities? And how do you leverage that kind of investment to create more investment in the inner city? You don't have to worry too much about you know fixing uh, roofs and schools in uh, in Barrington, but you do have to worry about it in Providence. And so it will be interesting to see how that how that's handled. Last issue, Christina Paxson, president of Brown University, has done a very unusual thing, in which she has literally drawn a line in the sand about partners uh, coming into the into the Providence market. She thinks it's a job killer. She thinks it's detrimental to her medical school. She thinks it will be one-way uh, train tickets for procedures up in Boston. Uh, and there's lots of reasons to agree with her. We've, we've, we've not seen too many acquisitions by Boston-based companies that have turned into big wins uh, for Providence jobs, C-suite jobs, infrastructure jobs. Uh, it's very unusual for a uh, college president ever to take such a public mm-hmm. stance, and especially an Ivy League president. I mean, it's almost unheard of. What do you make of all this? Well, I, I have a tough time figuring out what to make of it because I hear too many stories, they're all anecdotal, uh, that people here have to wait three or four months to see a specialist, you mm-hmm. know, for an illness, uh, where they can see a specialist in the region they live by, you know, getting on a train or driving somewhere for 45 minutes. So these state boundaries are a product of colonial times, they're not a product of modern, modern economy by, by no means. But what I get most interested in is I certainly understand the position and I understand uh, the role Brown Medical School plays, which is an important role, but her partner is a for-profit hospital. And I, you know, as conservative as I am, I always uh, was brought up to believe that uh, the community-based nonprofit hospitals uh, are are the way to go. Those guys will argue, hey, listen, if we didn't come in, Probably one or two of those facilities would be closed. Absolutely, we've invested seventy million dollars, and, and I think we've they, protected those jobs. I think they're doing a good and job. And Bob Whitcomb would say, "Why isn't a for-profit? Listen, when CEOs of hospitals are making three million dollars a well, year, that's a different what, what's the what the the but, tax status but, is? But you, but you got a non-profit. This is interesting. You got a non-profit. George Vecchio in one year with his with Six his million bucks. sixteen million dollars. Yeah. But you got you got you. This is in the case of Brown University. You have a, a nonprofit public institution uh, that has the state's only nonprofit medical school. Correct. Who has a relationship, you know, with uh, you know nonprofit lifespan, and now their new partner for this venture is a for-profit hospital. Right. I need to think about that one. Right. Um, but we've never won. I mean, we've we've looked at this issue. Uh, Bank of America acquires Fleet. Bank Boston, gone, Superman uh, National Grid, buys Narragansett Electric, that's now a hotel, pub, uh, and uh, outdoor music venue. Uh, It has not sustained many jobs over the past few years. And you just have so many 20-somethings that will stay at the pub (laughs) all night and listen listen, listen to the music. Uh, it's 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 a tough issue, and I certainly understand, you know, Brown's... A position because they need to protect the medical If school. Christina Paxson calls for the Rhode Island Rebellion and to take up arms to fight off partners at the Rhode Island border, is, is Gary Sass driving his Mercedes Ben Maserati hybrid up to the uh, Woonsocket Bellingham border to fight it out? No, at my age, I need, <laughs> I need doctors. I'm not going to do anything with the tax. I need doctors right now. I need as many doctors as I can possibly get. <laughs> yeah. No, uh-huh. it's, 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 I think it's an interesting commentary. I've, I've been a little facetious, but you know the fact that you know Brown University, who's had a long-standing uh, tradition as a community-based uh, institution, you know, with community-based hospitals and a community-based medical school. One of the strengths of our medical school to begin with was that it was going to service all the community hospitals and now our partner is a, is a, is a for well but I think care New England has forced uh, you know the mismanagement there the failure there 120 plus million in losses in the last 25 26 months uh, has reset uh, the table and and and, and, uh, we're, and, and, and the fault is ours because we let personalities get in the way of logical decisions you know you look at women's and infants it was built on the uh, 
the lifespan or Rhode Island Hospital campus yeah. for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and personality has gotten in the way of that reason. Um, I want to thank the money man. Um, uh, how are your bitcoins going? Uh, I have a bitcoin here and a bitcoin <laughs> there. You know. Um, I think the budget here in Rhode Island is going to be very exciting. I think there's a lot of twists and turns. It's obviously election year. Uh, obviously, this Pawsox deal is a curveball and maybe the in relative importance to all the other things that are going on in Rhode Island, one of the least important things that has ever been debated to this level so in the history of the state. For four years, <laughs> we were debating where to locate a minor league baseball park. Yes, a, a dying sport, minor league, and we already have a stadium. Uh. Well, but, it's, but the stadium is not as functional. And, you know, the, the issue that keeps on... Cardings up, Field seems to be doing okay down in Newport. No, I, I, I make the analogy. Cardings Field was built in, whatever, 1920, 1930. It's probably got bigger crowds now than it's ever had in its entire history because they created a good environment. But the and, atmosphere is... Yeah, the atmosphere. And they get big crowds down there for as many people as they can fit in the place. Well, but, uh, but the issue with the Pawtucket Stadium, uh, the, the two issues, the, the first issue... As a matter of public policy, should we be creating a public-private partnership? And that is a political public policy choice people make. You pay your money, you take your choice. The second question is, once you've made that decision that you want to go forward, have you done your due diligence? Do you know what your risks are? Are you managing your risks? And the third I, point... I always say about this deal, if the risks were so minimal, those guys would be grabbing that risk because they could make money off that risk. But this is, you know, we won World War II in less time than we made a decision on Pawtucket Stadium. Just about. I think, yeah, just about, right. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen to that? Uh, I think it gets kicked to next year. I think, uh, it, listen, everybody suggested to Larry Lucchino a number of things. Uh, m most competent people suggested to him, one, don't do it in an election year, first and foremost, because it just creates more complexity. And second of all, make the deal much more like a Massachusetts deal. What Massachusetts has said is, we'll be your partners. But whether it was Fenway expansion, the new garden, Gillette, and a number of other different projects, you build your stadium, you own your stadium, you're financially responsible for your stadium. We'll help you with infrastructure, with land acquisition, with exits, with parking lots, with all those things. But you, it's your business, you take the responsibility. And a smart guy has been on this show numerous times and said, mm, winners, losers, and when you just invest in hotels that don't create a lot of long-standing jobs. Who said that? I don't know. You know, we have so many guests <laughs> who are right. so smart, I can't keep no, them I all up. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not just an economic, it's a cultural and, and community you know, issue as well. But we need to make a decision on it. And uh, I, you know, the longer that we let it stand out there, the more energy takes out of the room. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, we are done here on Business Monday. It was uh, rock and roll. Uh, Rajiv Kumar, fancy new lawyers over at Hinkley Allen, uh, Mr. DBAs from the Department of Administration, and Cha-Ching, Gary Sass, the money man. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Ava Gaudet's got uh, uh, arts and entertainment at the 3 o'clock hour, and Kate Nagel is back in the 4 o'clock hour with news and politics. Thanks, everybody.